Today's lecture, we're going to answer or look at a couple of big questions about colonial Virginia. You've read in your book and you've it, a lot of stuff this chapter and this topic deals with uh, the settlement and the development of Virginia and all of the colonies. But Virginia tends to be one of the more important, one of the more critical, and in many ways one of the more interesting colonies, especially in terms of talking about the 17th century. The big question I want to cover is this, is why and how does Virginia go from being, you know, a generally lawless, chaotic, unstably violent, mortally dangerous colonial society, especially between 1616 and 1675, 1676, you know, the era of Bacon's Rebellion. How does it go from that to by 1720, it is, it's a model of aristocratic, uh, planter-driven economy. It's highly stratified, but very stable colonial society by 1720. And more importantly, if you look at Virginia's role, particularly in early America, out of this society, the society that it was the model of instability in the 17th century, you know, in the 18th century and early 19th century, it produces our major leaders. You know, four of our first five presidents are from Virginia, and they are from a particular class of Virginians that we're going to talk a little bit about today at the end of this lecture. And so th there's lots of different elements that go into this, but we're going to look at how leadership evolves in the 17th century in Virginia as one of the answers to this question. I should keep in mind it's not the only answer. And in fact, there'll be some other lectures where we look at some other aspects of Virginia society as well. The first thing I want to start with is uh, I would like to look at the problems that are present right from the beginning of the rise of the tobacco economy. You know, 1616, John Rolfe cultivates the first successful um, you know, crop of tobacco in Virginia. And by 1619, all available land in Virginia uh, is, is used for tobacco cultivation, right? That tobacco is the first great cash crop in, in the colonies, right? I mean, you know, you have, you have sugar down in the Caribbean, but tobacco becomes this, this major cash crop as far as uh, the American colonies are concerned. And it's important to remember that, that tobacco is it's addictive, right? Our first big cash crop that comes to dominate colonial society and export is an addictive substance, right? And then we know that that creates this incredible, insatiable, ever-growing demand in Europe for this product. And around any sort of addictive subject, substance, right, anything that great of demand, we get these really hardcore, boomtown driven economies that are all focused on the creation of this one export good. And so many of the problems that we see at the very beginning of this century will remain problems throughout the whole 17th century in Virginia. We're just going to point out a couple of those first and talk about them to, to get a sense of what Virginia is like. The first thing, and I, I should also say, the problems I'm about to talk about, you know, they're not just problems for Virginia plantation cash crop society. These are problems for all cash crop plantation societies. They're problems in the Caribbean and in Barbados. They're a problem in Brazil, in Carolinas, right? They will remain problems all the way through the history of those other colonies, however. You know, Virginia, and, and to, to a large extent, the Carolinas as well, for the same reason, they come out of this a little differently. These problems are in one way corrected. They have other problems that continue. But there is something about their history that, that's different, right? That makes this cash crop society. I mean, Virginia to this day is a, a pleasant place to live. So this is a function of history. The first thing that I want to talk about, and the big problem, is this unequal distribution of land. And uh, we, we have to talk a little bit here about and I know you read it in the book, but I'm going to reiterate head rights and uh, indentured servants. You know, the problem is cash crop is a very labor intensive, I'm uh, sorry, tobacco is a very labor intensive cash crop, right? It's a year round production. It has to be grown in several different areas and moved around. 
Uh, so it requires lots and lots of labor. It's very, very intensive. And there's a problem, right? Virginia doesn't have a lot of people living in it. And they have to come up with a way to get people who are willing to come and actually work in what is backbreaking labor. And they come up with this system. The Virginia Company of London comes up with this system called Head Rights and Indentured Servants. So first of all, it's a head right. Well, a head right is kind of literal. Basically, if you could pay your way to Virginia, if you could pay your transport and pay to set yourself up in Virginia, the Virginia Company of London and later, uh, you know, the government of Virginia would give you a 50-acre plot, right? You get one 50-acre plot for you, one per head, and that would be yours to work on. Additionally, anybody else you paid to come over and work, right, to work for you, you paid somebody else's, you would get an additional 50-acre plot. So if I'm, if I'm Liam O'Brien, I, I have some money, I could pay for myself to come over, and I find nine other people who I pay their passage, and I'm going to pay to put them up on my land, right, that's nine plus one, that's a thousand, um, sorry, that is 500 acres for me, right? And that's, that's how you could build a fairly sizable plantation right at the beginning. It really did two things. It got people to come over with some money to help invest, you know, and develop this land. And two, because in London at this time, there's a huge growing mass of young, single men and women uh, who are landless, they are low skilled, uh, low literacy rates, who have very few prospects in the old world, who are eager for this opportunity to come over because there's a second part that goes with the head right. So if I pay for you to come over and I get a 50 acre plot, you owe me something, right? You owe me four to seven years of your life to work as my servant, as a bonded labor, laborer on that piece of land. That's called being an indentured servant, right? In many ways, uh, your status isn't all that different from a slave, except for one thing. It's for a limited period of time. But I do have quite a bit of control over you. I can discipline you. You may not wander off. I, I can punish you by extending the amount of time you work here and impose physical punishments on you. But nonetheless, after that four to seven years, you're free. And not only are you free, but you get your own 50-acre plot. So here's the thing, you have this chance. You're a landless young person with low skills, low prospects, low wealth in hyper-competitive London. You have no future. Here's this opportunity, a guy says, hey, I'm gonna pay for you to come over. I'm gonna work you like a dog on this plot of land. I will have a lot of power over you. However, after this four to seven year period, if you survive it, you get a 50 acre plot of land for your own. And of course, you know, all the advertising in London's town, time you know, talks about the great fortunes that people can make just by going out to Virginia and setting up shop. There's a lot of advertising. So in the heads of people, they're like, this is my chance. I can, I can leave dusty, competitive, um, you know, unsanitary London behind where I have no future for, after a brief period of time, a chance to be a wealthy man to, or, or woman, because women came over as well. But it's overwhelmingly single young men. And so that's, that's how it works. That's how you get head rights and indentured servants. Indentured. Well, in theory, this could have been a good thing. Here's the problem. And it's a problem of geography and a host of other things. But first and foremost, it's a problem of geography. You know, in Virginia, in colonial Virginia, you know, there's no effort put into, and we're going to talk about some detail, developing town and community infrastructure, right? So they have a lack of roads and town centers and warehousing. And like any farming community, the best land, of course, is on the river. So if this is the James River here, or a navigable river that feeds into the Chesapeake, right? The best land is, of course, right along the river. And all the wealthy planters, the successful planters will all hold this land. You know, when you're done being an ex-indentured servant, you've survived your indenture, you get land. Well, they don't give you land right along the river. You're further back. And it didn't take long. I mean, if you're a few miles off of this river, the land they give you is essentially worthless. You can't transport 
your goods and tobaccos to the market. They just sort of rot in the ground. Secondly, here's another problem. You say, well, it's great. At least I have land. I can be a farmer. These aren't farmers. These are urban dwelling youths of low skills. They didn't bring farming skills with them. All they brought was their ability to work hard. And the third problem is many of these people who paid for your head right and kept bringing over constant waves of indentured servants cheat them out of their land. They don't give them any land at all or give them land that is so far off onto the frontier. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's worse than useless. You know, they're in danger of starving to death. Uh, and they would collude with the political structures of the time in order to constantly make this ever-growing group of dissatisfied ex-indentured servants who are bitter, who are young, who have few prospects. The one thing they did have was guns. They tend to be armed. They were able to get guns. They could hunt. And, you know, this is one of the biggest problems in colonial Virginia. And in many ways, it may be the underlying problem that creates the most social instability. A small group, hyper-competitive group, controlling the only good land, making huge profits, and an ever-growing group of dissatisfied, frustrated, cheated, young, male, and single, and well-armed settlers constantly expanding into the frontier. Right? This creates a real hostile powder keg. And as we see, if you've read, you've read the chapter, we know that this explodes into Bacon's Rebellion in 1675 and 1676. But all throughout this period of time, it led to a couple of key problems, right? And lawlessness and chaos and violence. So one of the first big problems we have um, is this sort of unevil, uneven distribution of land that comes out of the nature of being an indentured servant and the head right system, uh, the lack of, of available good land, the lack of effort put into developing structures that would make this other land more profitable and the fact that they're getting cheated, that it's this hyper-competitive, ruthless, boomtown economy. I call it a, it's like a jungle socioeconomic Darwinian economy where ruthlessness and competition is in many ways the only law at all. These guys get cheated and driven out. Leads to a second growing problem that was a problem for all of colonial Virginia, and it's lawlessness. There aren't really structures or traditional institutions put into place to prevent lawlessness. There's an incredible amount of violence between ex-indentured servants, between the planters themselves. You know, you had to do more than just plant on your land and grow on it. You had to defend it. You had to hold it. You had to survive on it. There weren't courts there to press your claims and your property boundaries. It is in many ways this economic free-for-all where, one, there's a lot of violence just in the general community, and two, uh, there's, like I said, there's no strictures on competition over land and over title, over position. And so, you know, it's this, this economic competitive free-for-all. Another reason for this lawlessness has to do with leadership, which we'll talk about more in a minute. But there was no vision. You know, they didn't settle. When we compare, if you look at how Pennsylvania settled, right, by William Penn and this sort of Quaker ideal, it's this incredible vision. He draws up a plan, you know, this sort of mathematical, logistical plan for Philadelphia before he even moves there, and they lay it out. If you look at New England, they had a plan. They had a way they were going to set up their town structures. They would build things moving out from a common structure. They moved over as families. They'd already discussed what the political organization would be. This lack of, of plan and vision among the leadership, the leadership doing little more than to you know, uh, protect other members of this, this small, ruthlessly competitive planter class, you know, didn't lead to the imposition of the institutions that promote law and order. And as I said, it's, it's somewhat involved, the lawlessness is the nature of the servants themselves. You know, these are the people who come from the lowest rung of London society, right? They are illiterate by and large, they are very low skilled, they're poor, and they're young. I mean, youth and especially cheated youth tends to be right, more chaotic, more prone to social unrest. This is, this is true now and then. I mean, this is a, a reoccurring problem in societies, right? And furthermore, the male nature, the overwhelmingly masculine nature of this group. You know, men immigrate to Virginia uh, eight to one. There's eight times more men than there are women in colonial Virginia. There is a small group 
of single young women who also come over as indentured servants. And what's interesting for them is they had a hard lot of servants, but if they survive their indentured, most of them, because of the paucity of their numbers, are actually able to marry into the planter class. They were the most desirable, uh, they, they had a lot of prospects, far more prospects, quite honestly, than they had as young, single, urban, landless women in London. It's still a harsh life, but there was only so many uh, women who could become wives and start families with. So you have these men that don't even really have a prospect for family, for uh, producing a future generation. They are truly unrooted. And like I said, unrooted, cheated, growing numbers of young men who are well armed creates instability. Another huge problem is uh, disease, right? Lack of sanitation and a bad water source. You know, the James River, which, and, and the rivers that feed off it are the main water sources uh, for almost all of this settlement. And it's, it's high, it's a very, very high salt content, very high bacterial content, and typhus, dysentery, and salt poisoning uh, is rampant in Virginia society. I mean, the death rates from that will remain very, very high. And, and again, that they don't, with the sanitation, without this lack of leadership, this idea of building any other infrastructure other than something that grows and mass produces tobacco and ships it down the James River, leads to, like I said, a lack of sanitation. These things are a product of, of a structural community. Another big problem, and this again is a reoccurring problem all through the 17th century, is uh, violent confrontations and violent relationships with the Native Americans of Virginia. And you know, the Powhatan tribe and the other um, Algonquin peoples in the area are constantly coming into conflict, violent conflict with the settlers. You know, sometimes it's a low grade conflict, you know, few in the, a few Native Americans here, a few backcountry settlers there. Other times it erupts into full scale war. You know, in 1624, you know, the, the colony is on the verge of being eliminated. The, the Powhatans have launched this massive uh, drive to push all the colonists out. And they're dwindling. I mean, they come very, very close to doing it. And, and there'll be several other major Powhatan wars. And again, the reason that these violent uh, confrontations happen goes back to what we've already talked about. It's this large and ever-growing group of indentured servants who keep coming to Virginia. Once their indenture's over, they don't get good land, so they're constantly pressing into the countryside. And you know, they believe they have a right to land. And the land that they often claim is land that the Powhatan tribe themselves claims. In fact, often they already had an agreement with colonial governors and the Virginia House of Burgesses that, hey, this is our land. But you know, the, the settlers in between, who tend to be violent and competitive, come into a lot of conflict. And it does, it stirs up a lot of conflict. And so, uh, you know, war with the Native Americans is, is prevalent throughout the whole 17th century in all of the colonies, but it is particularly pronounced again and again uh, in Virginia. All of that combines to create something else that is very unique to colonial Virginia as far as compared to the other continental colonies in America. And that is its outrageous mortality rates. The death rates in Virginia are staggering. And this is something that, that every historian who looks at this is, is taken aback and they try to work with it. There's lots of different explanations for it. I mean, in many ways, it's just a combination of all the things we've talked about. Constant Native American warfare, the violence and the lawlessness of the society, uh, the ruthlessness, the way the uh, indentured servants are treated uh, and their poor nutrition and the, their physical abuse, the general lawlessness of the indentured servants themselves after their servants, right? And disease, salt poisoning, this all leads to uh, a, a very, very mortally dangerous colonial society. Early on, it's, it's almost horrific, you know. It, between 1619 and 1624, you know, they figure roughly 3,500 migrants, right, come to Virginia. And within that five years, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of them die, okay? Even by the end of the century, by, the seven, by 1700, well over 100,000 migrants had come to Virginia. And yet there's only about 60,000 people living in Virginia at that time. And very, very little natural increase, meaning the uh, growth by having children, right? So an indigenous population among the settlers 
they don't have, doesn't really occur until almost 1720. It tells us that, you know, we look at these numbers, how many people came, how many are there, just how mortally dangerous Virginia society is, the sort of price of chaos. And I should say that these death rates conditioned uh, quite a bit of, of the colonial economy, the culture of that economy. Because the death rates are so high, and I should say the death rates are high for the planter class as well as the indentured class, with all these things considered, it creates an outrageous amount of social mobility. You know, the one promise that is there, there is the potential for social mobility in Virginia. There are people who come over, thoroughly middle class, and even some cases of people who come over as poor indentured servants who, believe it or not, yes, the ruthless competition and a fairly hardy constitution are actually able to become wealthy planters, to enjoy political power and prestige in this, uh, in this society. It does happen. However, their numbers are very, very small, right? This is the ultimate sort of uh, threat balance between liberty and security, right? There's this great deal of liberty in terms of being able to do what you want and struggle and compete. However, there's very low security. It's an unstable society where death and starvation is a far more likely outcome for everybody, especially early on, uh, than success as a wealthy planter. And so this brings us to the question, who rules Virginia? Because what I really want to talk about today is the rulership of Virginia, the governance of Virginia, and how it evolves. Well, we'll start in 1624. As I said, the Powhatan War had erupted. Uh, King James I, near the end of his reign, has had enough with the early chaos of Virginia. He sends over the military to, to uh, help squash this, this Powhatan uprising, and he's successful at that. He revokes the Virginia Company of London's charter, and he declares um, Virginia a, a royal colony, means he's going to put it under direct royal control. And in order to press his claims there, he actually sets up a governor. He sends over a governor and a council, right, whose job it is to uh, pursue stability and make sure that what happens in Virginia reflects the imperial and global interests of the British crown and of England. Right? When we talked about this in an earlier lecture, this is the establishment of the political force of imperial interests. He also does something else, and, and it may have been a mistake, but he revives the Virginia House of Burgesses. You know, it existed in 1619. Uh, it's, you know, Virginia's in chaos, and so it doesn't exist by 1624. He has actually a chance to just rule with just his governorship, but he says, no, nope. he revives the Virginia House of Burgesses because he wants them to be responsible for levying taxes from the local populace. In his mind, he says, you know, I don't really want to throw uh, good money after bad if this doesn't work out. And so he gives them that responsibility. In the short term, it was probably a good idea because they do take over taxation. In the long run, as I said, it creates one of the central dichotomies that leads to the tension that erupts in the, uh, you know, uh, the American Revolution. That is, the Virginia House of Burgesses will be made up almost exclusively of these sort of ruthless planter class uh, who, whose main interests are protecting their ability to make money any way they can, run society any way they want without interference from the colonial governors or the crown or any outsiders. In fact, they will always see the colonial governors as, as the outsiders, right? And so you have this tension right from the very beginning. And also the Virginia House of Burgesses will, will give a lot of cover for the uh, illegal and aggressive competitive economic cultural attributes of the planter class. Right? They actually sort of enshrine this, this jungle economics. And so reviving the Virginia House of Burgesses at first actually doesn't do what James hopes it will do. I do want to talk about another source that could have been a source of social stability and leadership in the colonies, in Virginia in particular, and that is the Anglican Church. You know, the Anglican Church, uh, James makes it the established church, the official and only church allowed in Virginia. And he does this because he's an Anglican. 
He has these tensions between Anglicanism and Puritanism at home. He really wants to keep the Puritans out of Virginia. And so he does. He, he establishes the Anglican Church. And, you know, the Anglican Church, like many of these sort of official churches, you know, might have provided some sort of central stability, a moral culture, a legal culture, leadership. As I said, if we look at Pennsylvania and under the Quakers, and certainly uh, New England under Puritanism and Congregationalism, you know, religion did function at that level. It was wedded closely with uh, communal and colony-wide stability. It does help produce the leaders. It does give a sort of moral backbone to general societal behavior. So in many ways, and it does help forge communities, you know, brings people tighter together. And in these more forged communities, tighter communities are more stable communities. So religion has that function. Unfortunately, Anglicanism has almost no effect no impact on Virginia colonial society at all. Virginian settlers, uh, the colonists tend to be irreligious at best and outright profane at worst. You know, and, and the reason for this is quite simple. There are no town, civic, um, physical structures of community in Virginia. All of the effort is put towards, you know, these plantations, particularly the ones closest to rivers. Tobacco cultivation rules all. And, you know, we think of community sometimes as abstract, as, as, as these um, social relationships among groups. But communities also have a structural reality, one that you actually have to build. And in fact, if we look at New England's towns and if we look at, you know, Quaker towns in Pennsylvania, they knew that. They went out of their way to build meeting houses first, to build roads that go out from common spaces, right, to create places of government and uh, central meeting. I mean, this is, you know, communities don't just magically happen. They require structure, they require vision, they require planning, particularly in a colonial setting. And there's none of this in Virginia, right? This is, and as I said, this is a problem for almost all plantation societies. But in Virginia, it's, it's, it's pronounced. And so what happens is there's 42 separate parishes uh, of Anglicanism, and it's called Episcopal. It's called the Episcopalian Church here. Uh, so the Episcopal Church, Anglican Church is one and the same. And there's divided up into 42 parishes, but they only have eight to ten ministers at any one time who have almost no congregation to rule over. So, you know, the Anglican Church tends to be a real aside for the entirety of, you know, uh, 17th century and even early 18th century colonial Virginia. The political leadership will come from several different phases. It's really three phases. The first phase starts right around the time they start cultivating tobacco, 1616, and runs, let's say, roughly to 1630. So 1630, 1616 to 1630 is this first phase. And what they try to do is they try to import the social stability from England. They actually go to the landed nobility. Now, remember, in England, there's, there's landed nobles, right, people who inherit their title, inherit wealth, right, and they are... Uh, leaders in politics. And among them, and I, I wrote this on the handout you have for this that you can print out, there's this sense, it's a, it's a French word, but a great French word, and I love this word, it's noblesse oblige, noblesse oblige, a noble obligation, which is just this general sort of sense that both English society and, believe it or not, the nobles themselves had this sense that, you know, they had a responsibility as privileged people to act with generosity and nobility and leadership towards the less privileged, right? That along with title and privilege came responsibility. And not that everyone was this perfect selfless leader, of course, but it does actually work, you know, for, for hundreds of years in England and much of Europe, the nobility does sort of function as this stabilizing political force, right, between the crown and the people, right? And they inherit this this uh, sort of august nature that the people uh, and the government does respect, it does enshrine. And they'd hoped by actually transporting actual nobles, right, and giving them large tracts of land, just saying, hey, seizing land from others and giving them some prime plantations right on the river, right, and then they would be the leaders, the natural leaders of this society. They would function as a stabilizing political force. And through noblesse oblige, right? And, you know, the need for stabilizing political force and social force is quite apparent, even from the very beginning. The problem is this. 
these landed nobles from England were not, they were not any more culturally prepared. In fact, maybe in some ways less culturally prepared than any other migrant who went to colonial Virginia. They're not part of a ruthless, economically and socially competitive class of people. Their culture isn't actually one of competition and ruthlessness at all. They inherited what they had. Their power was, and their influence was taken for granted. And they certainly proved to be no more immune to disease, violence, death, mortality, and Native American warfare than anyone else there. And they died in similarly large numbers. In fact, in many ways, they were less able to compete and assert themselves. You know, in Engl you know once removed from the sort of English context, all their prestige and their presence uh, was not offset by their lack of competitive culture. And truthfully, by 1630, most of those who came over as these landed nobles, these would-be leaders, had either died or fled, had moved back, said, this is not for us. The next wave of leadership, it would sort of be the defining wave of leadership, rises up about the middle of the 1620s and would remain in control until the 1660s, uh, is this more ruthless competitive class. And they are the leadership that kind of allows Virginia to unmake itself, right? They're the leaders whose main interest is uh, competitive maximization of wealth, driving your laborers as hard as you can, using any means necessary to secure the land you have and not share it, right? They create the conditions under which this happens. In many ways, their lack of leadership or lack of visionary leadership, right, enables a group of people to be quite wealthy and powerful, but allows Colonial Virginia to descend into chaos and a lack of infrastructural development. Um, so who are they? Some of them are just some migrants who came over and through uh, hardiness and, and, and incredible competitiveness rose up. Many of them are sort of this, this rising middle class in London, these sort of competitive people in the middle who didn't necessarily have farm skills and don't really necessarily have, um, you know, well, they don't have nobility or name, but they were very good at competing. They're risk takers. They're, they're avaricious, yet they do have some vision about how to make money uh, and how to be profitable if given the chance. You know, they, they manipulate this head right system. They start coming over in fairly large numbers, and they do. By the 1630s, they've risen to the top as sort of this new planter class, right? Not born of nobility, no sense of noblesse oblige. And as I said, it, you know, it's during this period of time we see the rise of this sort of Hobbesian boomtown, right? Um, you know, some people can rise to great wealth, you know, uh, in this sort of profiteering chaos, but ultimately their governing or their lack of governing allows it allows Virginia to become what we were discussing before, that it's more people likely to die disease-ridden and penniless than to live as politically influential planters. And again, it, it's under these where, like I said, the real seeds of instability are ultimately displaced. It's, these early leaders will come to dominate uh, the Virginia House of Burgesses. And by using you know, the legal powers of the Virginia House of Burgesses, really begin to systematically cheat ex-indentured servants out of their head rights. You know? And they don't need them for their labor because you can always bring more cheap indentured servants in from London. Right? So there's this endless flow of people coming in. And they allow this ever-growing mass of chaotic, violent, single young men with no prospects to constantly amass in the countryside, leading to Native American conflict and general instability, right? So that they really kind of, you know, this 30-year period, they, they really plant the seeds and actually make them grow of a really dangerous level of sort of violence, instability, and extreme class differentiation. Part of the question has to be asked, so why does England allow this to happen, right? Tobacco is valuable, right? They would have wanted a way to make more tobacco come. And they're getting, you know, merchants in England and the government in England, they're not getting their fair share and their cut of what's being produced either. They're allowing this to, you know, this should be an otherwise very profitable and stable colony is descending into chaos, producing money for just a few. So why does the powers that be in England allow it to happen? Well. The reason is, and it's something we've already discussed, is because between 1630 and 1660, the home of England is in a state of chaos itself, right? 1630, 
Parliament has been suspended by Charles I. We have this growing tension, openly a hostile tension between Puritans and Anglicans, right? 1642, an all-out civil war in England will erupt. 1649, that civil war ends with the Puritans and the parliamentarians winning. They behead Charles I. As I, as I said in a previous lecture, his family flees. And uh, England comes under domination of Oliver Cromwell, who was the head military leader of the Puritan forces and himself a rather extreme Puritan dictator. Now, Oliver Cromwell actually loved law and order and may have been the very man to actually impose law and order and stability on the colonies. However, his attentions for the next 10 years are elsewhere. One, he's kind of interested in creating his own Calvin's Geneva in England. He passes a whole bunch of laws that impose Puritan morality as the general laws of England. There's no dancing, no swearing closes all the bars, he closes all the theaters, right? There's this, you have to go to church, it's now a matter of law, he's a Sabbatarian, right? There's that extreme side of Oliver Cromwell. And internationally speaking, his main focus is increasing the military strength and presence of England throughout the European world. Um, one thing he does is he begins to drastically expand the British Navy. It's really under England that the British, I'm sorry, under Oliver Cromwell, that England's Navy becomes, uh, you know, the trope for all great powerful navies. He's the one who really puts the money and the focus at that. He saw the value of it very early on. He launches wars against the Dutch, who at the time were the preeminent naval power, and he's successful. And another big part of his focus, and it's somewhat religious and somewhat old standing, uh, English hostilities, he invades Ireland. Ireland under, during the English Civil War, had been able to uh, attain independence. It had been in revolution against England. Well, he reinvades Ireland and does a, a, a really systematically vicious and extreme crackdown in Ireland through these really brutal, total war, if we think back to the Aztec lecture, these total war style of, of culture of warfare eliminates the Irish. Oliver Cromwell dies in 1559, and he's succeeded by his son. And Oliver Cromwell Jr., much like many sons of, of, of great men, is a weak doppelganger of his father. And actually within one year, everyone is sick of him, and he's deposed. And in fact, they bring back the, the son of Charles I, Charles II, in 1660, and re-coronate him, right? And they, they coronate him, he becomes king, and he's Charles II, reestablishing the Stuart line. And this is called the Restoration. And the Restoration of 1660 is an important dividing line, and it comes up in your textbook a lot, too. I just want to, just so we're clear on what this, Charles II will begin to say, all right, we've gone through this long period of chaos and instability in England. He wants to impose order. He says it's time to make things more profitable, more regulated, more orderly. He looks out at the colonies and he sees, he says, all of the colonies, New England included, have been basically governing themselves. They've enjoyed far too much independence. In some places, it's created a hostile political culture in, in New England, and in Virginia, it's created this sort of chaotic instability. And he'll come up with several different approaches on how to address this instability. But the one I want to talk about today is he notices from the very beginning that Virginia has a problem in leadership. We need a leadership class. Now, what he does is he looks at Virginia, he says, you know, all these guys who had been the leaders of Virginia between 1630 and 1660, they weren't self-reproducing. Uh, most of them are still single men. Many die. As I said, Virginia is deadly for the powerful and the weak alike. And he fairly easily imports a new leadership class. And the people he's going to pull are these very wealthy, rising class of urban dwelling elites, right? These are not the land and nobles, but they're people who want to be like the land and nobles. They're people in England who have obtained fabulous wealth through participating in the international economies that are growing during that time, right? They're bankers, they run insurance companies, uh, they're merchants, right? They're sea captains. They're this rising wealth, this really dynamic and competitive class of people. But in spite of their wealth, they can't get all the prestige. Uh, money doesn't buy you all the prestige and political power you want in England. 
there still is this sort of tradition of the landed inherited titles, right? This landed nobility. And, but they want this prestige. And so Charles offers them this opportunity. He says, listen, I want to send you to the new world. I'm going to have you go to Virginia. We will basically commandeer great plantation land right on the lakes. I'm sorry, right on the rivers. We'll set you up there. And we will make sure that you occupy the upper house of the Virginia House of Burgesses. We're going to strengthen uh, the colonial governor and his council. And, you know, it'll be from your class. will be most of the councilmen. And we would like you, basically, we'll give you all this as long as through your leadership and your sort of presence, you really actually try to govern wisely, be an example of stability uh, and fairness and justice, right, for Virginia society to add to sort of improve and stabilize the chaos of Virginia from the top down. And what's interesting is how easily these guys really do slip right into that role. You know, because the first time they tried this with the landed nobles back in the 1620s, the reason why it failed in many ways, one, because of the chaos, but also because, as I said, those, those landed nobles, they had the prestige and the bearing, but what they didn't have was a competitively ruthless culture, right? They weren't competitors. They had never competed for what they had. They didn't have that other side of leadership that is valued in Virginia, and they succumbed. These new group of guys, this wealthy urban elite, well, they have the prestige and the bearing and they're literate and they know how to act noble. They had been mimicking nobles in, in London. But what they also had, these are guys who made their wealth through the outrageously competitive, outrageously competitive and diverse economies of London and of the whole world, right? They knew how to compete economically and socially. And so they were able to bring both of those skills with them. They, were, they could wed together you know, a certain amount of ruthless economic competition as well as a sort of elite sense of noblesse oblige, which they do recreate. They actually, over time, do actually create this image of themselves as the elite, the rightful elite of the area, who will be the main uh, political leaders and social leaders who do kind of create this culture, that this, this southern planter class culture of um, acting nobly and politically on behalf of those less wealthy, right, the disenfranchised. Now, they start arriving in 1660. <clears throat> they can't undo immediately the 30 years of chaos and destruction that had already happened. As a matter of fact, nothing they can do uh, offsets that cathartic, over-the-top, violent chaos that erupts uh, and bloody, deadly chaos that erupts in 1675 and 1676, Bacon's Rebellion. Right, which you've, you've read about in your book. And if, as a matter of fact, Nathaniel Bacon, who launches it, is one of them. Right? He's a member of this elite class. He just happens to be even more ambitious than they are and, uh, a, and a demagogue. But after Bacon's rebellion, they don't flee. They remain. And they become what is known as the first families of Virginia. They come over with families, for one. They're not single men. They're men with families, right? And, and they have children, and they are able to become these leaders. After Bacon's Rebellion, they will, by 1720, be hard, well ensconced as the leaders of Virginia society. And it's from their progeny they bequeath their wealth and their influence to future generations. Names like Jefferson, Carter, Harrison, Lee, Washington, Monroe, Madison, um, Tyler, the names that actually become future presidents, that become these, these dominant, wealthy, political class blue bloods that, whose, whose influence will be uh, huge in our society, politically, economically, and socially, even into the 20th century, right? A really durable class is created out of this chaos. We'll talk more about the other social aspects that enable that to happen. But it is important to realize that the first move happens from the top down, is that actually after the restoration, this new imposition to sort of create uh, an elite class, a dynamic nobility, not just an old you know, static nobility, but to sort of use the characteristics of the rising elite in London to forge leadership in the new world, it's actually a fairly visionary movement uh, that does in the long run stabilize Virginia, politically and economically. Those are the main points for today.
Thank you.